So hi everyone. So today we'll actually continue with introduction to computers, programs, and Java, and then uh, we'll start uh, elementary programming. Before we start, I just wanted to remind everyone that the labs are in uh, these course documents for the class. And again, you only have to submit one problem to get the credit for the lab. The rest of the problems are just for you to practice programming. So the TAs will go over a couple of these problems. Each TA will go over at least one of the problems. <clears throat> and then you'll basically have to uh, submit uh, one to get the, the uh, credit for the, for the lab. Uh, I updated the recordings in uh, uh, Piazza. So you will find there the lectures one and two uh first part of the current lecture that we'll go over you also find the labs always we record the first lab of every lab basically of every set of labs the first section and that's the one that i post here but if uh, some of the tas are still recording the lab even if it's not the first section so if you go to zoom link you will actually find all the recordings for basically including the current lecture and uh, this morning there was a lab and so on. Let's see if there are any questions. Uh, which problem? We, whichever, one of the problems of the lab. You don't need to uh, submit them all. There are five problems, for instance, in lab uh, two. Uh, if you submit one, you get a credit for the lab. It shows that you basically are practicing programming. There was this question that many of you may have noticed in Piazza, which was asking if uh, you don't know how to solve a problem, uh, should you uh, Google it? And my answer was that I advise you not to search for the answer. That's not the goal for the lab. I prefer you actually to just submit one problem and, and uh, I will still give you the full credit for the lab. You better ponder on how to solve that problem longer time than actually just searching it for it online. Uh, what we are, uh, our goal is to learn programming. It's not to learn searching on online. Okay. So yes, you will get full credit if you only uh, do one problem. But I would like you to try all of them, and you can submit all of them on a blackboard. Uh, I can basically see how you evolve in time. At the beginning, I expect that you solve one, usually the one that is solved in the lecture notes, but then in time you will get better and better. What are you supposed to submit for lab one? Uh, the, uh, the two problems that I showed in the recording last time. So the welcome to Java or hello world. uh application problem and the change maker or you can submit the hello world for lab one and the change maker uh for lab two because it's the first problem of lab two do you get extra credit for submitting more no you get uh, practice and a better understanding of programming and that's the final goal of the class so there is no extra credit that you do more uh, there is no incentive whatsoever except your knowledge and your practice of programming yes you i already said in the previous lecture and i'm saying it again now if you submit one uh, answer one single problem you will get full credit for the lab the lab is just for you to practice and if you need help to ask the TA is to help you. Okay, that's what the lab is for practice. You can put the same code, but so, okay, the TA usually shares their screen and uh, solves one or more problems, one problem per TA, uh, of course. Uh, and this video is available on uh, Piazza. Uh, you can do the same coding and get the same answer. At the beginning, this is okay. You are basically programming uh, and later 
you basically see how the TA solves a more complex problem and you try to do it without looking at their code and just copying, just trying to actually solve it yourself. Okay. Yes, uh, again, the goal of, so you can submit each one of the labs by the end of the uh, week. So all of these labs that you will find in course documents are actually due, if you look in the due date, and I assume that you have access to that, they are due on the Saturday uh, midnight. So basically, uh, you don't need to attend the lab if you want just to practice on your own time and uh, submit the solution for that one problem uh, by end of the uh, week, by Saturday at midnight, that's fine. Okay. Okay. So let's continue with uh, the first lecture. If you have more questions, I will watch from time to time the chat, making sure that everybody understands everything. Okay, so last time we talked about number systems. That's basically all that we were able to finish. Today we'll continue. So basically all that is stored in memory are binary uh, numbers in binary uh, uh, system, binary number system. Now the memory is actually also organized in multiple segments, multiple parts. There is a stack segment which is used for storing temporary variables used uh, declared inside methods. You'll see what those are later. Basically, the idea is that you start with the main method, but the main method calls other methods. And you have to now move to execute that other method with its own set of variables, which is called the referencing environment. All the variables that are available at some point in the execution. So what what is used for executing methods is a stack. A stack is like a pyramid. You can only put objects on the top of the stack. And when you finish a method, you take it from the top of the stack. So you return to the previous referencing environment or uh, activation records for a method. So really, we are a stack is basically a data structure that is used for storing the current set of variables that is available to the program. And uh, this has its own space in, the exec in, the mem in memory. Uh, then another space that is used in memory is the heap. So the heap is, if you think about like a, a unrestricted area in memory where a method can attach, it can create an object that method may finish and return to its caller, but that object is still available. So it's basically, if you think it's kind of like a piece, a white piece of paper where you can write anywhere. And when uh, no matter where you are, you can basically still have access to that object. So the heap is for dynamic data. When Java, these are created with a new operator. When you create a new object, like a new string, it is put in the heap. These are basically constructed objects. They are persistent even if the, the method that created the object uh, terminated. As long as there is a reference in the set of variables in the program to that object, that object still is, exists. Java is different than C in this respect that in C, uh, the programmer is responsible for creating objects and destroying them when they are not uh, used anymore. In Java, we rely on an automatic process called the garbage collector, which actually looks at all of the variables in your program. And the moment that there is no variable that references an object in the heap, it automatically deletes it. So it does garbage collection for you. Okay, There are methodologies to do this. Mark and sweep is one methodology that you mark all of the uh, objects, all of the locations in the heap, and then you go over all the variables in your stack. And if there are no variables that are pointing some locations in the heap, those locations are uh, garbage collected. Another segment of memory is the global segment. This is where your program actually, the one, the program that is executed is stored. There are also other variables or data that are created at compile time. 
like for instance, uh, intern strings or static global static data. These are stored there because they were uh, they are created the moment that the class is created. So uh, instead of creating them on demand uh, at runtime in the heap, they are created in this global segment. Mostly is the one that is used for the program. Okay. How our objects are stored? Objects are stored in slices in in uh, in Java or any, any any other programming language in the memory. So usually this is part of uh, uh, your addressing of objects in memory. So when you install an operating system, you are basically told that uh, this is a 32-bit machine or a 64-bit machine. And that basically tells you that all of what is the size of slices uh, in, in the main memory. So when you address, when you, you have an address to a certain location in memory, what's the size of that location in memory? And in fact, it can be anything between eight, uh, and 64 bit. Uh, usually older systems are eight bit or if you have a small device like a cell phone is 16 bit architecture. Uh, modern computers are 64 bit uh, architectures, basically meaning that the size of a slice that is addressable uh, is 64 bit. So not everything smaller will actually be allocated in a 64 bit location but some of it is unused, okay? Now, why is this important? It's important because in Java, you have many, many different types. So you have primitive types like integers or byte, and then there are uh, reference types like strings. And I will explain you in a couple of minutes what uh, this difference is between the types. Maybe it's a good moment now to explain it. I will actually make this let me start paint and let me explain to you. So in Java, you have to define variables yourself. Okay. So you define, let's say a variable integer i is equal with one. The, the meaning of this is that i is uh, an alias or a location of memory somewhere in, in memory, which actually stores the value that uh, was assigned to i. So it basically stores one. So in that location, one is stored. And then there are another type used in Java called reference types. Let me explain those. So for instance, string is a reference type, S is equal with A, B. Okay. String is a reference type and is different than primitive types like the variable i, the integer uh, type that I had before. And in the respect that s is an alias for a location in memory, but that location doesn't contain the string a, b, it actually contains the address a reference to a location that contains the uh, an object of the type string. So here we have some object of the type string that has that string that you saw before. It basically has the characters A and B. Okay. So these are the, uh, the type integer is what is called the primitive type. And there are only eight primitive types eight types that the variable is actually an alias for a location that contains that value that was assigned to that variable. And then there are all of the other types in Java, which are basically reference types. When you assign to a variable uh, an object, in fact, that variable is just an address, is basically the address of that object. And that object is stored in the heap or in the global segment of memory, if it's something that was created, is known, is like a constant that is seen at compile time, this object is actually created uh, in, in the heap, in, in the uh, global segment of memory. But th that difference you will see later was the difference when we have something like uh, this string that I defined here, 
or a string that is defined as follows. Let me show you this, another example of a string, okay? So this is a string S2 that is equal with a new string that contains A, B. So in fact, both of these are stored in the same way. You have something like this, S or S2 are basically an address of an object that contains the string AB. The, different, the only difference is that in the case of the example above, this example of it, with an internal string, the string AB is created in the global segment of memory. So this is in the global segment. In the case of string S2 is equal with a new string, this is created in uh, the heap. So the difference is minor, the fact that this object string is in a different segment of memory, but in either case, S and S2 are references to that object, wherever that object is. Okay. Um, one thing that I want to tell you about, and I think this is relatively important, is the fact that there are only eight primitive types. So again, there are reference types, and let me write it down here. This is a reference type. And there are primitive types. And there are only eight of them in Java. So in most programming languages, C Sharp is also just eight primitive types. So what are those primitive types? Boolean, of course, it can store true or false. So for instance, if you say Boolean T is equal with true, it can only store uh, it, true or false. It, it actually suffices to have a single bit. If it's on, uh, if it's one, then it's true. If it's zero, then it's false. That's a primitive type. Another primitive type is car. So character C is equal with a character like A. That's also a primitive type because you know exactly always what's the size that you need to store that character, which is actually not quite true because we will see how is this stored in memory Unicode. It's an encoding that says this character code is stored in memory. Then there are four uh, integer types. There is byte. Uh, you saw byte before. It was just eight bits basically and can store values that are relatively small like 127 very small values so it's basically just eight bits to store that one byte then we have short which can store a little bit bigger values values that fit in 16 bits like for instance let's say 5000 or even 300 because 300 is bigger than 200 is 55 that is maximum that can be stored in a byte okay so this is stored in 16 bits then we have integer which is stored on four bytes or 32 bits like integer i is equal 60 6500 this is stored in 32 bits uh, we have long which can have very big values. And it's internally stored on eight bytes or 64 bits. Then we have two real types. So we have float, which basically uh, it's stored in 32 bits, but it's a real number. So you can write something like this, 1.234 as a float and double, which can store bigger values, okay? Yeah, like for instance, minus 10. This is a scientific notation. Again, this is uh, occupies eight bytes, and this occupies four bytes. Okay. Let's see what questions we have in the chat. Okay. I will tell you about variables in just a few moments. Basically, variables 
are aliases for locations in memory. So like, for instance, this is integer i is equal with one is a variable, what we have uh, up here in the upper corner. So basically they store a value that can be used for uh, uh, grabbing the value of that from that location, or it can be uh, uh, updating that value. Okay, any questions? Okay. Okay, so you can see the scientific notation right here. So this is the scientific notation. And the meaning of this is that this is 1.23 and so on, multiplied with 10 to the power minus 10. So basically it's multiplied with the base, the base in uh, for this number is 10 and the power of that base is minus 10. So it basically it's multiplied with 10 to that uh, power. Double has 10, 15 di decimal digits, not quite true. It basically, it's double can store uh, the, okay. Double can store uh, doubles in the IEEE notation for eight, that can be stored on eight bytes, okay? Approximately, this basically tells us that this can store from uh, in an interval numbers from minus two to the power 63 because it uses 64 bits up to two to the power uh, uh, 63 okay so it basically just tells us that it it's it's a, uh, it's, it's a big number. And of course, this is much bigger than decimals with uh, uh, 10 decimal digits. Okay. So it's a little bit different than uh, 15 decimal digits. It actually tells me that it tells us that it can store uh, uh, numbers that are, can be that are represented on uh, 64 bits. Okay. We will get into some of these details a little bit later when we talk when we talk more about types. Okay. So let's return to the lecture notes, and I will tell you a little bit more about uh, uh, storing, and then uh, we will basically probably will get into the types. That's actually in elementary programming. Okay. Good. So hardware stores zero and ones, and also data is grouped into uh, slices. Uh, the smallest kind of slice is eight bits, also called a byte, and uh, it's addressable. We can access that data. The first question that you may have is how do we store text? Until now, we only found out that you can store numbers. And even for numbers, you have to basically convert decimal numbers to binary, and then you can store them in memory. And the question, the answer is that each character actually has a number. Uh, there is an encoding that says this character uh, is stored internally as this number. So there is an encoding. And there were many different encodings developed. Uh, in 40 years ago, there was an encoding called ASCII, which basically used one byte per character, and it was basically able to represent 127 different characters. This is the ASCII encoding saying that basically uh, characters in the Latin alphabet, uppercase, lowercase, uh, some signs, the digits, they all can be represented as, uh, uh, the character can be represented as a number. And uh, this number is encoded, it's uh, uh, translated into binary. So for instance, A, is the number 65 and 65 is stored uh, in, in binary. It's in stored, if you look at the hexadecimal here, it's stored as 0, uh, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, because it's 41 in hexadecimal and each one of these hexadecimal digits can be changed into four digits in, uh, in binary. So really, 
what we uh, what we use today is something called Unicode that stores that basically can store 65,000. Basically, it uses four bytes for storing characters. It's basically using uh, 64 bits, two to the power 64 different encodings of characters. Okay. So that's basically what Java is using. Java is using Unicode. And Unicode actually has different encoding schemes. The encoding scheme that is used by Java is called UTF-16, meaning that by default it uses 16 bits, not, it doesn't use uh, 65,000 different characters, it uses a variable encoding. If it's possible to encode it in 16 bits, then it encodes it in two bytes, but uh, for those characters that have the code bigger than uh, 16 bits, it basically has the last bit is actually used as continuation bit. So it's a variable encoding what Java uses. So basically, uh, this is how Java uh, and any kind of programming language stores characters in memory. Now let's get into programming languages. So there are many different programming languages and they evolved in time from very, very simple programming languages. The first kind of programming languages were called machine language. They are basically binary uh, instructions. So if you think of ENIAC, which was developed by the Navy uh, and John von Neumann worked uh, on ENIAC in uh, late forties, basically they were encoding uh, every single instruction in binary. The central processing unit would get a binary string, uh, uh, a sequence of digits of bits, and that binary uh, sequence of bits, it would tell the processor if it's an addition or a store instruction or anything like that. Basically, the input would be either by setting switches or with a perforated card saying that if it's perforated, it's true. If not, it would zero. It would be zero. It would be false. So at the beginning, everything was machine language, a sequence of bits that directly controls the processor. If that is the input, the processor would do an add or a comparison or moving the data from one place to another. Examples of such programs are easy to find and GCD is uh, 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 represented in x86 machine language below. So you can see this is binary. It actually is using hexadecimal notation because you have E5, EC, E4, F0 and so on. So this is binary machine language for computing the greatest common divider between two numbers that are read from the user. Now, of course, nobody programs these days in binary. It, uh, there is no reason to do so. It's very hectic. Uh, the first thing that happened was assembly languages were invented to allow operations to those machine language instructions to have a mnemonic abbreviation. So instead of using a binary version of basically that machine language, those instructions were given uh, an abbreviation like add F3. And this is an example that basically what it does, it takes the values from two locations of memory, register one and register two, would add them together and would store the result in register three. So the only thing that this assembly did, it gave names to uh, uh, names that you can remember instead of remembering a, a bunch of binary uh, codes, you would now remember a, a limited set of instructions, of assembly instructions. And some programs today are still developed in assembly. So you would write the long assembly file with a lot of these uh, instructions, add, store, and so on. And this would be compiled by an assembler into a machine language. Basically, the corresponding string would become a binary string. And that was the first uh, addition. Uh, assembly string languages instead of binary languages. But, and this is an example, the greatest 
this common divider in 8x86 assembly, the one that you saw in binary before, is here implemented in assembly. And you can see push, move, sub, uh, subtract, and so on. And assembly was far easier than actually implementing things in binary. But still, it's not uh, user friend friendly. Everything has to be a very low level operation because it's mapped directly to a, a machine language. And programming would be extremely time consuming. There are still programs that are developed in assembly, like for instance, uh, uh, antiviruses, because they have to be extremely fast. But most programming uh, is done today in higher level programming languages, like which are basically programming languages where you abstract with a single statement a lot of different instructions in assembly. Like for instance, when you have system out print ln and you put a string, that's actually a lot of assembly instructions because assembly is very low level. It basically updates, uh, it says, take this character, put it here into this location of memory that corresponds to the output stream, screen, take this other character and so on. So higher level languages are much more user friendly. Uh, one instruction in a higher level language is transformed into many instructions in assembly or machine level. Moreover, uh, they are platform independent. You write a program in Java, it doesn't matter what is the machine language, it will be uh, uh, rendered on Windows, on Linux, on, uh, on different architectures, even lower level when we talk about machine language, machine learning, it will be rendered on a computer that runs x86 and one that it runs MIPS as different uh, uh, machine languages. And there were many different higher level languages. The first ones were Fortran and Lisp, but uh, these days we have a lot of other programming languages. One thing that you should keep in mind because, uh, is that the fact that programs written in those old languages are still around because once a company invested a lot of money to develop a large source code for let's say a bank or uh, a NASA uh, uh, program, it's extremely expensive to now reinvest the money to, money to uh, implement it in Java or C or Python or anything else. So you will still see programs that are written in Fortran, in COBOL for banks, in BASIC and so on. So this is kind of like they are sorted here in uh, order of, in historical order. So the first one, the first higher level programming language was really Fortran. And then there was Lisp which is a functional programming language, uh, COBOL, BASIC, the first Windows system and DOS were implemented in BASIC by Microsoft. Uh, Pascal, it's a language that was quite popular at one time, but the, uh, nowadays it disappeared because the company basically disappeared. C uh, was actually one of the first kind of programming languages. Some people consider it to still be a little bit low level because you, you can modify the pointers, the addresses of these objects that I that you have in memory, and you can do pointer arithmetics. You can actually use these addresses to compute the value, the address for other objects. Java doesn't allow you to do that, and no, no modern programming language like Python and uh, C Sharp allow you to do that anymore. Then there was the object-oriented version of C, which was C++, uh, Java, uh, C Sharp, which is a Java-like language developed by Microsoft and Python and Lua and other programming languages these days. Now, most of these programming languages work in two different ways. The most common way is compilation. So basically a compiler is another software program that takes as an input a higher level source code, higher level language source code, and the output is assembly code or machine language code. So you basically, what the compiler does, it takes a source code, like a C language uh, file or a Java file, it compiles it into a lower level file, like machine language file in the case of C. 
Usually this is also followed up by a linker that takes library code. So the first step in C compilation is that you get an executable, but if you have out uh, calls to uh, uh, library code, like read or uh, uh, print, they are not directly put in the executable file. They are basically uh, linked only by a next program called linker into an actual executable file. Sometimes the result is not actually executable, is assembly. And then you need another step, which is basically an interpreter that takes instruction by instruction and transforms it and runs it on the machine level, the actual architecture. So now for us, modern developers, programmers, we basically, as users, we write programs and these are application programs. Uh, then the, these application programs are hosted on an operating system, which basically gives you a file system, user control, and other facilities which are necessary for us to use the computer. And that actually runs on the hardware, on whatever CPU we have. And these operating systems, uh, uh, most popular that we use today are Windows, Mac OS X, Android, Linux, and so on. Java is somehow different than those compiled languages that we saw before. So in, in a compiled language like C, you would use a compiler for your architecture. Like for instance, for Linux, you would use GC, GCC. For uh, Windows, you would use CL that comes with Microsoft Visual uh, C. For Java is somehow different. Java started with first with the principle that you write a program without having to consider where do you run it. If it's running on Windows or if it's running on, uh, on a, a Mac or if it's running on a, a C and uh, on Linux and so on. So Java started with the principle that you write the source code once, even if you compile the source code, the binary code that you get is actually binary code for a virtual machine. It's standardized binary code that is platform independent. And then you can, uh, this binary code is compiled by a Java compiler in basically general binary code, which runs on top of something called the Java virtual machine. This Java virtual machine is actually the program that is distributed separately for different architectures. That's why when you install Java, you have to install the Java for your computer, for Windows 64-bit, or for Linux, or for Mac OS. These Java programs are compiled into bytecode, and this bytecode is now run on different JVMs for different operating systems. And that's the, that was the whole idea why Java is probably the uh, one of the most popular languages today. Is basically that the program now that you get runs anywhere uh, on different platforms, sometimes in web applications and so on. There were different versions of Java that were released in time. The first version was actually 1.02 in 1995. Uh, we actually, today we have Java 15. Uh, I was actually writing this last year about that Java 14 was expected in March, 2020. There are also different editions of the JDK and the JDK that we are using for this class is Java standard edition, uh, which basically is for developing client, client side standalone applications. There is also the Java Enterprise Edition, which basically has libraries for developing server-side applications that support uh, Java servlets and Java server pages. There was also a Java Micro Edition uh, used for developing small applications for mobile devices. Our textbook uses the standard edition, and that's what we are going to use this entire semester. And here is our first program, basically that I showed you one of the previous classes, welcome.java that has one class. It starts with two comments, 
first. So comments are text that is left there by the programmer for himself to remember what he was doing or for other programmers that share the same source code. And this is ignored by the Java compilers. So you can leave any messages. Like for instance, what does the program do? This program prints welcome to Java. Then we have the class. So the public class in this case. So basically the pro a program in Java is a class, okay? And every class starts with the declaration that this is a class and what's the name of that class. In this case, the name of the class is welcome. And this is the public class for this file. So the name of the file has to be the same with the name of the public class in that file. In one file, you can declare multiple classes as long as only one is a public class. Everything else has to be default, like uh, basically either that that class has no modifier, like public here. I will also tell you in a few moments what the modifier is. But the, the file contains only one public class and that name, the name of the file has to be the same with the public class in Java. A class may contain multiple methods. The methods are basically one of these blocks that contains multiple statements. Uh, there is one single method called main, which basically takes an array of string arguments and doesn't return anything. The return type is void. The signature of the main method is always the same. It's a public static. Public means that is available to other classes, uh, out, other classes in other packages to everyone that wants to use it. Static means that this is a method linked to the to this uh, class is not a method linked to uh, object instances of this class. Void is the return type of the met method. It says that this method does not return anything. Void means nothing is returned. Uh, main is the name of the method. And then within parentheses, we have the arguments for this method. So like think of sinus, sinus of 50 degrees. It's a math, it's a function in mathematics. You are basically all past level four of the math uh, entry exam. A function basically takes arguments. So in the case of this main method, in the parentheses, we have the arguments. In this case, it's an array of strings. Then we have the implementation of the method. So we have an inner block. A block basically starts with curly brace and ends with curly brace and then enumerates all of the statements that are executed in order when you invoke that method. So what happens with this uh, class? And in fact, I will show you in Eclipse. So I'm starting Eclipse. Professor, quick question. Go ahead. Uh, when you were talking about void earlier and you said it doesn't return anything, um, I, I'm just a little confused because like, um, like, uh, the question that was in one of the labs, the Celsius one, where you had to convert Celsius to Fahrenheit, you still have to return a value. You print the value. You okay. don't actually return it. Return means, uh, I will show you actually, let me close all of this. Change to the Java perspective. So let me create a new class. So we call it welcome. Let me delete the package. So we basically are in the default package. Okay. So if you print something, there's not a problem. Just a second. And then, but if you want to return something, so for instance, public static, uh, integer okay increment you take an integer i as uh, the input parameter and you return i plus one even let's say that actually this is double and it's changing temperature from fahrenheit to celsius Okay, and you get a double as the temperature in Fahrenheit and 
you want to return the value of that temperature in Celsius. If I remember the uh, formula exactly is F minus 32 uh, multiplied with two or something like that. Basically that's something close to how do you transform from Fahrenheit to Celsius. So this is a function that takes a double as an input and returns another double. Okay. If you only want to print the temperature, that temperature from Fahrenheit to Celsius, you would write something like this, public static void print print Fahrenheit in Celsius. And then you get a double F and you print system dot out print the print temperature the temperature from Fahrenheit to Celsius. Actually, I think it's divided by two, not multiplied with two. But that's uh, actually it's two point zero again, because uh, integer division returns the quotient of the division, so it's not quite precise what we actually want. So what's the difference between these two? This doesn't return anything. This one returns actually the temperature uh, in Celsius. So uh, there was another question, but I uh, interrupted you. So is there any other question? Uh, yeah, like, um, like I'm just a little confused about like doubles and floats. When do we know when to use each of them? Uh, when do you use doubles and when do you use float? Okay, that's a good question. A little bit early, but I will tell you. Uh, if, if you have an extremely big number, so for instance, double D is equal with uh, math dot power two to the power 50. Okay. For that, you need a double because you basically need enough space, 64 bit space to actually store two to the power 50. You cannot store this into a float. Float and it's actually probably you can see it already because to the power 50, you need 50 bits at least to represent that to the power 50. But a float can only represent numbers in 32 bits. So obviously you can't represent something that you need one followed by 50 zeros uh, in binary to represent to be represented on a 32 bit location okay so you don't you use double most of the time but when you want to save space if this would be to the power 10 then it can be represented as a float number so you would you can do something like this you can basically take the result of math.power of 2 to the power 10 and put it in a space that is only 32 bits. So you cast it down to uh, basically a float. Okay. But let's return back to our lecture and I will get to that in a, in, in a little bit. Uh, we'll basically do this about types later, maybe not today because probably will not have the time. Thank you. So welcome. So let's actually write the program that we have in the lecture notes, system.out.println, uh, welcome to Java. Okay. So this is basically a program in Java. It's a very, very simple program in Java that all that it does, if you run it, it basically prints welcome to Java, nothing else. 
If you want to see how it works line by line, you put a breakpoint by clicking to the left hand side of the editor until it appears a breakpoint, a line breakpoint, and then you execute it with the debugger. So instead of running it with the run button, as we saw before, we run it with the debugger, which opens a different perspective where we see uh, basically all the variables that are defined and we can execute step by step. Any questions? Okay. So uh, let's take a small break of uh, about two minutes. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Okay, so void means nothing will be printed out. That's correct. And uh, 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 you, you will know later about uh, the different segments of memory. Okay, any other questions? If not, let's basically continue. Ah, I see one question. You don't have to call the function. Yes. When you uh, define functions like the ones that we had before, these two, if you want to invoke those functions, you have to call them. So for instance, the function print Fahrenheit in Celsius, you can basically call it uh, with a temperature uh, in Fahrenheit. So 23 point, let's say 56 degrees, you need to call it and then it will basically be uh, executed. So you will see here is minus 4.22 degrees Celsius. If you want to call the other method, because it returns a value, it doesn't actually uh, print it. You will basically have to call it within uh, a, 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 a print statement. So you would basically call it this way. And then it will basically print the same, the same temperature uh, because basically it's the same function, but this in this case, it will actually invoke the, the function and it returns the value in Celsius and that will be printed. So there are two different methods. This one prints the temperature, this one returns the temperature. And if you want to print it, you will have to basically put it in a print statement. Okay. Uh, public static void gets called automatically. Uh, 
I'm not quite sure what you mean by that question. Good. So let's return back to the slides. So here you basically can see uh, that uh, you write the program, you compile the, you save it to the disk, you compile it with Java C, then the result is bytecode, then you run the bytecode with Java, which basically shows you the result. There are two types of errors that can occur. The first type of errors are compilation errors. Basically, if you had a syntax error, like for instance, you forgot a semicolon or another kind of static error, like for instance, the type of uh, some expression is not what it was expected, then you have a compilation error. And in that case, you will have to modify the source code to fix that compilation error, compile it again. And only when there are no compilation errors, you will get bytecode that is executable. If during the runtime you had an error, and these are called runtime errors, uh, then you will basically, uh, the program will crash and you will basically have to correct the, that runtime error. So let me give you an example of a runtime error. For instance, you are reading from uh, a disk and so, like a flash drive and somebody pulls out the fresh time. Then you will get a runtime error. Basically, you will try to read from that location. You cannot, and the program crashes. Another kind of uh, runtime error is when the syntactically the program is correct, but it doesn't have a correct meaning, OK? So let me show you an error like that in uh, Eclipse. For instance, I print. I want to print the result of one divided by zero. Syntactically, it is correct. One divided by zero, it's integer divided by integer. Not, not a syntactical problem there. However, the result of anything divided by zero is infinity. And you can't store infinity. Infinity is too big to be stored, okay? It's infinite. So you will basically get a runtime error arithmetic uh, exception division by zero. So this is not a compiler error. Syntactically, this program is correct. Even if you are thinking, I'm going to read from the user, the user will give me two integers. The user may give you zero as the denominator of that division. And in that case, the division will give you infinity. So you basically, that's an error that crashes the program, and uh, but at runtime. At syntactically, this is correct. It's compiled correctly. Okay. Good. So this is basically how a Java program is runs. And you can actually, and this is was the, in the first lab, you can run it from command line. You can uh, compile it. You can write it with Emacs or Pico or any editor that you want, Notepad then you compile the file and then you run the Java file. And that's the result that we are getting. Now, two things that you should have, and these are usually added by your uh, JDK installation, uh, are two environment variables, two variables that are basically saved into your operating system. The first one is called path. So path is available in your operating system and it's the list of all of the locations in your file system that contain executable files. So when you run something from command line, like for instance, Java or Java C, uh, these are actually executable files that are somewhere in your file system in one of the folders that is in your path environment variable. So this is basically the location that contains the list of all of the locations that contain executable files in your uh, environment variable. I will show you on Windows how to actually see what is in a path. So if you open a Windows Explorer and you go to this PC and you click right on this PC and then in properties, you go to advanced system settings and in advanced system settings, you will see environment variables. 
And for environment variables, you will have all of the variables for your operating system. Path is that variable that I showed you before as a list of all of the locations where executable files may exist. And in fact, this one tells me that I have Java installed in program files, in C program files, Java JDK 1.8.0 uh, revision 201. In the beam subdirectory are basically all of the executables that are used by Java. So in fact, let me show you, I copy that location. Let me close all of the windows. And I paste it here and it basically shows me everything that is there. You can see that Java C is there, Java is there and other files like jar is actually an uh, archiver that creates a zip archive with the extension jar that basically may contain multiple files, okay? So really this is the first environment variable. The second environment variable is actually used by Java and Java C is the location of all of your Java classes that are used when you run your program in Java. So again, this is added by your uh, installer for Java. Usually it should contain at least the current directory, but it contains basically all of the folders or directories where you have uh, Java files, okay? And once you basically have these two variables set, which are usually done by the installer, you can compile your source code and you can run your bytecode. This is one setting the set class path to uh, basically the current directory, dot is the current directory, which may be missing sometimes when you try to run Java welcome and you can't run it. You can't run it is because your current folder is not in the class path. Running in the IDE is much simpler. You click on the run button or you select the file that you want to run, you click right, and then you run as a Java application. And that will basically run your uh, Java file. If you want to trace your program, you put a breakpoint in the instruction from which you want to trace it. And then basically you can execute it step by step. Let me tell you about the syntax, basic syntax of a Java program. And we will talk about comments. There are three types of comments in Java. You can comment as an entire line or an entire paragraph, everything between forward slash star and end of forward slash star, star forward slash. Or you can actually even populate the documentation for your program called Java doc with comments. And I will show you the three different types of comments. Then there are also reserved words. These are words that have a meaning in Java. Uh, and they, they cannot be used for other things. You can't use them for names or variables. Like for instance, class, public, static, types like int, car, boolean. They are reserved by Java. It's a small set, about 100 words, that are only used by Java. And you have to use other names if you want to name your variables. Modifiers are basically a subset of the reserved words. Those that define properties for your variables, for your uh, methods and classes. Statements are every action executed by your program. Like system out println was a statement. These statements are organized in blocks. Basically, from here to here is a set of statements. Some programming languages use indentation in your code, like Python. You probably learned Python before. In Python, four spaces is the indentation if you want some statements to be executed within a method. So indentation actually defines what the set, the, the block of a method is or of a class. In Java, spaces have no meaning. Basically, if you align all of your program at the first column, which you shouldn't, it's fine because actually a block is defined by the open curly place and co close curly place. In Java, a program is a class. So classes are used to define basically a program, a set of methods that are part of your program. These methods are like functions in mathematics. They have an input and sometimes they have an output Sometimes they don't, uh, you have void as the return type. 
One of these methods is the main method. It has a special signature, public, static, void, main, it takes a, an array of strings as the input. So let's start with commons. There are three types of commons in Java. You have line commons. So for instance, if I want to say here something like print one divided by zero, this is ignored by Java. This is basically a line column. It starts with double forward slash and everything that follows it is ignored up to the end of the line, new line character. Then there are paragraph commons which start with uh, forward slash star, and then it ends with star forward slash. It doesn't matter how long it is, if it's multiple lines, everything is ignored by the compiler. So for instance, let's say that I have forward slash star, and then the middle stars are really not necessary. They are added by the uh, IDE. Anything that is between these, is basically ignored. So this is only for me leaving some message for the future me when I forgot what I wrote here or for other programmers that use the same source code to remind them what I was doing there. I was printing one divided by zero. It's really a common, is not used by the compiler. It's just for me to remember what I was doing. A special type of paragraph comment is actually used by a Java doc. So this is a Java doc comment. So basically what that is, it documents the method or it documents the class, okay? So what this is, it basically, it's uh, something that is collected by the, the uh, documentation for my program. So let's say that, I want to leave some message in the documentation. This is the main method in this class, okay? I can generate the documentation. You see here in the project menu, generate Java doc, the documentation of my entire uh, uh, project. This Java doc is basically the list of all of the public methods for the classes that I defined. Is basically an HTML file that contains for that class every single method. The Java doc comments that I created, I put in the prior to every single method are actually those strings that will be collected when you have the method is the description of that method. So let me show you, I generate the Java doc. It will ask me for what package, that package, uh, and I want to document, document all of the classes. Okay, so now it starts generating documentation. And if I return back to the Java perspective, I have here doc. And one of the classes that it generated was for this welcome.html. If I open it with a web browser, I can basically uh, see that is not used anywhere. I think I might have had to save. The point of the Java doc is that it lists all the main, all the public methods. Uh, let me actually save the welcome to Java and regenerate the Java doc. It should have listed the main method because that was basically a method that we added, and it's a main method with a description. So give me just a second. Finish. Okay, there was an error that was far out. Okay. So I don't have, for some reason, this is not collected. Let's take it out just for the moment to see what's going on. The same problem arises. Warning. No problems. Where are the ones? Ah, I needed it actually. It was there. I still have the same error. 
ah, there is no description for those arguments. Uh, input to main. Let's rerun it. It's a little bit more strict than I was hoping for. Yeah, now it worked fine. So let's refresh this page. Open with this system editor, maybe? No, not this one. The welcome HTML web browser. Uh, still the same problem. It doesn't show the main method. Okay, I will have to figure out why this is the case because this second time it said that it generated the Java doc correctly. The point of the Java doc is that it actually should show. Oh, I have it here. I was looking at the wrong one open with web browser. So you see here. It's basically the uh, Java doc. It shows me that I have one main method and that main method has the comment that I put uh, in that main method that you saw before. Uh, this is the main input, uh, ma main method in this class. So really what it is, is a list of all the methods that are available in my program. So I basically don't have to look at the uh, program. Maybe I have a lot of code here, but I know that my code is all correct. I don't care how many lines I have and what is the internal implementation of that method. The Java doc just tells me these methods are available. This long list of methods are available to my class. I, I don't care how each of them is implemented internally but this is the list of methods available. Okay, any questions? So those are the th three types of comments in Java. Next thing is reserved words or, or keywords. They basically are words that have a specific meaning in Java. They cannot be used for other purposes. For instance, class. Class is used for defining classes. So you basically can't use it as a name of a variable. And there are many such keywords, which we will learn this semester. Abstract is actually a modifier is used for defining that we cannot create instances of a class. Basically that class is only used for grouping together my, uh, data fields of subclasses. Boolean is a type, uh, byte is also a type break is for a special statement uh, to basically break a loop and so on many many different uh, keywords uh, some of these keywords are called modifiers for instance public you have seen it when we define the public uh, main method basically it defines that uh, this main method is a, a method linked to the class it is not it's a um, that's static uh, public means that is available to any other class in any other package. Static modifier says that this method is linked to the class. It is basically not uh, a method linked to instances of that class. Uh, private is exactly the opposite of public. Uh, uh, private data is only available in the current class, nowhere else. Statements are actions that are executed by the, by the uh, CPU. So basically system out println is a statement, okay? And every statement in Java ends with semicolon. So you, in some languages like in Python and uh, JavaScript, because of the fact in Python that you have indentation, you don't need semicolon at the end because you know that next line based on the indentation, it's it's indented one, uh, four spaces to the right, it means that is basically part of the current statement. If it's not, then it basically means that is uh, next statement. In Java, semicolon is required because it basically, without semicolon, you don't know if the next statement is still part of this statement or not. 
Blocks are used for grouping together the components of a program. So you can have blocks for the class, you can have blocks for the methods, you can even have inner blocks. So basically, in my program welcome, I can have an inner block. Some of these statements are basically in an inner block. Okay, All of these statements that you see here are within an inner block. And it's just used for grouping all of the statements that are executed internally. Another thing about statements is that if you define a variable, that variable is available between the point where it was defined. Like for instance, I have an int i defined here up to the end of the block where that variable was defined. So I can print, let's say, i divided by zero. This is fine before the end of the block where i was defined. But if I try to print i divided by zero outside the block where i was defined, it will tell me here that i is not known. Do you want to create the variable i? And I would probably say that this is probably an error because i was defined, but it's not available anymore. It disappeared the, the moment that I finished the block where i was defined. So a block is basically one independent set of statements which are executed, okay? So those are what blocks are. They start, start with a open brace and they end with an end curly brace. There are many different types of blocks. Two in particular are used these days. One is called the end of line style, which means that when you define a class or a method, or a loop, you will basically put a curly brace at the end of that decla declaration, which opens the block of the components of that class or of that method. Another style that is used is next line style. It means that even if you declare the class here in the first line, the opening of the block is done in the next line. It's a, basically a more verbose uh, way because here you basically have a more compact way in the end of line style. You open the block in the same line. You only have five lines instead of seven lines. Okay. We use the end of line uh, style. This is what basically makes the code easier to see, but you will see older programmers that basically, or programmers that learned programming longer ago that use this next line style. I personally, don't like it because you basically make the program longer and easier to see in one single view how everything is defined. Now, the set of all of the methods and variables that is available for a class is called the API, Application Programming Interface for that class. And it contains all of the names defined that are available to you. These names can come from two sources. They can come from or, or your own classes, variables, or methods, or they can come from Sun or Oracle or any other uh, 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 organization that give, gave you a library. And it contains the set of all the identifiers, names. Names are used for multiple reasons. They are used for variables because you need to give an alias for a location of memory that you can read and write. And uh, basically you will need to reference it later after you name it in one place. Later, you will need to read my variable to read its value and maybe to write a new value into it. Like we have in this example where I define my variable, I uh, instantiated it with five. And then later I assigned to my variable, my variable plus one. So I read the old value for my variable and I, I put it back after I incremented it with one. And there are a few rules for defining names in Java. You can only use letters, numbers, or digits, and underscore. Dollar sign is also allowed, but only for special use. Like basically it's used internally in the compiler. In Java, you can declare another class inside a class that you defined before. So you can define inside the class welcome, the class blah, okay? When this program gets compiled, 
So we basically run this program. Uh, now it, run, it, it has an error because we def, uh, uh, divide by zero. But if this goes away and this goes away, this will not have a runtime error. But when we compile this, the class blah is actually compiled as welcome dollar sign blah. So this dollar sign is actually used for outer and inner classes. Uh, you will not use it. So basically the dollar sign is internally allowed inside an identifier, but only for a special use, inner classes in outer classes. Another rule about identifiers is that they all, always start either with underscore or letters. We usually start with letters. So it, you can't begin with a digit. Java is also case sensitive. Uppercase and lowercase are different characters. So you have a person with uppercase P or person with lowercase P, they are different identifiers. You can't, they are not the same identifier. So a few examples of correct identifiers are my variable, my underscore class and my for var. Uh, let me just finish this set of lectures because I know that we are one minute over, but we only have a few slides left. For my variable is illegal because it starts with a digit. My space class contains a space, so it's illegal identifier. My exclamation sign var is also illegal because you can only use the special underscore. Variables and methods start with lowercase letters, like lowercase x or two string. Classes start with uppercase letters like person. Variables and class identifiers are nouns, like person is a noun, radius is a noun. Methods should generally be verbs or verb phrases, like uh, convert Fahrenheit to uh, Celsius. That's a verb phrase. Use camel case notation when a variable name or a name it contains multiple words. So you see, my variable, it's capitalizing variable stating that basically I have two words in this identifier. Similarly, my class. So C is capitalized. Although it's legal, don't start with underscore. It's, there is a standard, kind of a styling standard that things that start with underscore are, are private. But this is only a style, uh, style convention. It's not actually a programming standard, required standard, okay? Use descriptive names. When you want to name something, name it with what it does, like linked list compared to area, pi, radius, and so on. So uh, it's hard to read code if you use strange names. I could have said instead of area is equal with pi multiply with radius square, y is equal with g multiplied with x multiplied with x. It, happens, it doesn't say anything to another programmer. So use always names that tell you what they do. There are three types of errors in Java, which you will encounter. Syntax errors, which are basically detected by the compiler. Like for instance, you forgot to put a, a semicolon at the end of a statement, or the type of uh, variable is not correct based on what you assign to that variable. There are runtime errors, which cause the program to crash to abort, like one divided by zero. It's not a syntax error, but it gives you a value that you cannot store in memory. You will need infinite memory to store infinity. And there are logic errors. Basically, that program may actually run correctly. Uh, correctly means that it doesn't crash, but you get incorrect result. So I will show you an example in a few moments. Here is an example of a syntax error. We haven't defined the variable. In Java, you need to define, before you store a value into a variable, that variable has to be defined of a specific type. So we know how much space we allocate in memory for that variable. So if this would have been int i equal with 30 is correct, because then we know i is an integer, it needs 32 bits. Java does not infer types without you defining the type explicitly. Runtime errors are basically those that are not syntax errors, but which 
crash the program. Like for instance, this is syntactically correct, integer divided with integer, fine. However, when you try to compute it at runtime, it gives you infinity, which crashes the program. And finally, logic errors. Logic errors are those which result in incorrect result. So for instance, let's say that I want to check if a number, which I read from the input stream, and I will tell you later, next class, how that is read, is between one and 100. But instead of checking with less than equal, I'm using strictly less. So if I enter, if the user enters one, I would like to have true that, yes, this number is between one and 100 inclusively, but I will get false because I used stricter less instead of less than equal. So it's only that you get the wrong result, but this is the worst kind of errors because basically you need to actually debug the program, run it line by line to understand why is it wrong. And there are three ways to debug a program. One is to read the program and think about the program, like hand trace it, what would be the reason why something is wrong. The second one is to put print statements. So it's quite useful to put print statements before you execute an operation and after, so you can see what is the result of that operation. For large programs, however, the most effective way is to use a debugger. So a debugger is a facility that allows you to set breakpoints, execute the program statement by statement, line by line, and then you can see how that changes the values of variables. You can actually see the variables. You can see the entire call stack and even modify the values of variables. So you see what happened. So in, let's say that I have a big program. I can set a breakpoint at the beginning of the program, click on this bug, which is the debugger, starts the debugger. And then I have three options. I can step into a method, I can step over an instruction and see the result, or I can step out, out of the instruction. And every time I'm doing that, I'm executing line by line the program, I can see the values of all of the variables in that program. So I basically see when something changes, uh, why did it change? Okay, that's all for the lecture today. Sorry that I went a little bit over time, seven minutes over time. We will continue uh, next class with elementary programming. Thank you very much. And I will put the recording in YouTube after the uh, class ends. Uh, let's take some questions. I have a question. Yeah. Go ahead. I was, I was just wondering um, what's the difference between print and then print LM? Is it just print line? Is there no difference? Or so the difference is that what in so when you print the next thing, let me show you in the program that we had before. If you print LN, uh, it actually goes to the next line. So print one, print LN two. It will print one on the first line and two on the second line. If this is print, just print, uh, it prints one, two. So basically it doesn't oh. print a new line after the first line. I understand it. Okay, thank you. Welcome. So let me stop the recording. So you have basically the lecture recorded. And if you want, 